To my immediate left, we have Richard Piper, who's a musician and actor who's been in many, many, but not all of Shakespeare's plays, including 30 in this very theatre, which is quite amazing. Ooh, that old, that old. <laughs> Uh, and on the end, we have Mark Wilson, who created and performed what the age critic Cameron Woodhouse called a daring adaptation of Richard II in last year's Melbourne Fringe. So, welcome. Ooh. Mark, I might start with you. Um, why do you think theatre makers are still drawn to performing Shakespeare, even 600 years since Shakespeare was writing texts himself? Well, I think it has something to do with just the density of the writing. There's just so much in each of the plays and each of the poems and um, and it's kind of a, a never-ending source of images and ideas uh, which, you know, through the generations, each, each new group of artists discovers anew or redefines for themselves or uh, reacts against previous ways of approaching them. Um, and also, Shakespeare was a social writer, so he was, he was writing about his world, and um, though a lot has changed in this however many hundred years, uh, a, a lot hasn't, you know, and, and so much is still about human interactions, which he, you know, mined so well. And what was it about Richard II that drew you to that play? Uh, well, I, it's, it was one of my favourite plays uh, of Shakespeare's, and uh, I saw a very bad production of it in London. <laughs> and um, <laughs> always inspiring, and it had. Um, I wrote in my in my book after seeing it that it uh, it had neither politics or poetry, and I was very unhappy. And uh, I came back and started working on this show, and we had all just endured the Rudd Gillard Rudd years, and um, and and Richard the Second just kept on for me speaking to that uh, that time. And um, yeah, it was a great source material for us to mine a lot of the gender politics that had happened. And um, yeah, again, like an endless source, but also he's robust enough, Shakespeare is robust enough that you can do whatever you want with him and, and you know, he's gonna survive. Yeah. J and G, why did you choose to remix Othello? Um, we didn't. We didn't actually choose to. Oh, that was um, easy. Yeah, it was a super simple <laughs> question, super simple answer. Um, the, Richard, no. the Globe, <laughs> the Globe Theatre in London was doing something for the cultural, called the Cultural Olympiad, right? And they did 37 plays in 37 languages, and we were, they approached us and asked us if we would uh, represent the language of American hip hop. Because we were thinking at first, like, why'd you call us in here? You speak English and we speak English, even though you don't think we speak English, we do. Um, <laughs> And no, and they said, you, you know, uh, you can represent the language of American hip hop, which was really cool for us to to have hip hop be recognized as a language. But um, also, they only had three plays left, and they needed to get this thing done. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he said, "How about Othello?" And we we're like, "Sure, why, why the fuck not? Let's do it." And we hadn't done a tragedy yet, so we were we were excited to do a tragedy, and that that was the perfect opportunity. But you had a Shakespeare background. Not so much. Um, no, Jay's had none <laughs> at all. Um, I, I, uh, I, I grew up with a reading disability, and I hated Shakespeare um, growing up. Um, and my mom reminds me of the time when I was like ten or twelve, and I came home pretty much in tears with, and I don't even know what play it was, but I hated it so much. I wanted to tear it up, and I just didn't understand it. I thought it was. Um, elevated language for highbrow people, and and it was, uh, um, and it was. I felt insulted and excluded and alienated by it. Uh, but cut to ten years later, um, when I was in um, at the experimental theater wing at Tisch School of the Arts at New York University, with an amazing teacher named Steve Wong, who who had us do exercises over spring break. I was casting Troilus and Cressida, so I was like, I, I got to do Shakespeare. I got to do this. And he ha we would do we would spend two to three hours on two lines of that our character would say. And we would do these exercises from everything of like start on the ground for thirty minutes, thinking about stuff and meditating, doing all kind of experimental theater, physically based acting is what the program is based on. And then um, you know over the course of the next two hours, you find yourself that you find the animal of your character, you find the sound of your character, you find this and that. And I remember this particular day where the lines, when I said the lines, like it didn't even matter if I understood it or not. Like 
it was it was music and that's and it, it still makes me emotional to think about that sometimes because that's that's what it i mean you could watch shakespeare in any language and if it's done properly like you will feel transformed am i right about that richard and and other smart guy uh, mark <laughs> I think that you're right, it's absolutely right, and I think the thing about, the, the, brilliantly represented tonight, is the way in which all these plays have, the, the great Shakespeare plays, have a sort of potency and a story that everybody can recognize. Now, there's not many plays that you can move, you can't, you can't put a David Williamson play on in New Delhi, with, to, a, to you, it just... It's not going to work in the same way that Romeo and Juliet, everybody in every culture all over the world knows about two people who, can't, who are not allowed to be together, about jealousy, about a jealous husband, about a manipulator like Iago. And I think the way that all those plays, that all those plays, the great plays, move into, even without the verse, that they all have a potency for every audience all over the world in whatever culture and whatever level of society they're from. Add to that the verse in whatever way, brilliantly represented in this rap was, is one of those great things and I always say with verse, with people working with verse related to what you're saying about how difficult the language is, start and just rhythm it. If you do that, you'll get closer to where you're gonna do it. And you, you know, an actor has to, there's no point in ignoring the verse just wrap it and get on with you know, and you'll actually get what what that's about. And then the emotion in the language, even if the not this the what happens in the play is acknowledged and it's an amazing story, but the verse, whether it's rap or iambic pentameter, lifts it into an emotional place that an audience goes, Whoa. So so you can go if if in a tragedy, we go, I'm gonna kill him. But in the play, it's mixed into something much more explained and graceful, as in terms of love and all those things. I think it's the rhythm of language, and that was what was so exciting for me to see that I saw their show last night. And was I'm going, it's ver this is verse, this is it's rap, and it's coming across. It, for all of you, it came across in the, is, as this incredible ball of energy. And what I loved was the way that there was so much fun in it, so that when it twisted, you got you went right down and it, they, it was a it was awesome. a beautiful night thanks, thank Richard. you very thanks much. so much yeah, man. we always say like shakespeare is a master storyteller who uses poetry and musical language Absolutely. And, that's exactly what we're both saying the same thing and that's yeah. what rappers are uh, you know our favorite rappers are storytellers who use poetry and musical language so. i think it's also just important to note that like as a playwright you're not writing words to be read you're writing words to be spoken or seen and heard. And so um, people get real academic with the Shakespeare, but um, it, he wasn't writing it for you to read it. He was writing it for you to go see it uh, and, or for someone to say it. So those things that happen, like that, that when the language gets elevated and there's like, um, I'll just think of an example, like, you know, the pieces of my puzzle, I'm pressing to place, and I can tell this work and see the stress on his face. There's a lot of alliteration in that. There's all kinds of things if you sat there and dissected. We never thought about any of that. You know, it's like, it's like when people talk about Shakespeare, they're like, and he left us all these clues. Like, no, he didn't. He was just, <laughs> he was just writing what sounded good to say at that moment. And because it was, felt good to say, it was the right emotion, and it happens to be the right tool to to get there, so I, I don't know, something interesting yeah. to note, and I think that happens really fast in hip hop verse, um, and because there is, you can't pause because the backbeat, so it's like, it's like Shakespeare, you know, on cocaine or something, you know, it's like. <laughs> well, also like Richard was saying, if you just do, if you do it to the rhythm, you have to, you have to find how to hit those beats without, Sitting in these moments yeah. that end yeah. up yeah. Shakespeare look really bad. Yeah, and it, it really just promotes, really. from what I understand, I'm not trained in anything, but um, <laughs> from what I understand from all from these guys who are all uh, who all on stage are trained actors uh, in college degrees in it and everything, uh, they 
say that it like promotes all the good habits that their teachers tried to teach them in school anyway, which is like act on the line, listen to the person well, and then react quickly. It's like, you don't wanna watch how life really happens. It's boring, you know? So you wanna watch it, the heightened version of it, you know? So. Uh, just picking up on that idea of Shakespeare as verse and music, Richard, do you want to tell us a little bit about Shakespeare's Secret, which is a oh, musical well, Shakespeare project yeah. that which was in the I last love, Writers' yes. Festival. <laughs> this is um, this is a, a band that I have, which is called Shakespeare's Secret. It's, it doesn't happen that often because it just drives me crazy getting all these people <laughs> together. But it, it's a different. It's it celebrates the the lyrics of Shakespeare's songs, which I've written and my writing partner Paul Norton has written there. Uh, it's it's a night in a bar or a uh, it can work in a theatre, but it's best if it's like a gig, and we just explore the words and the, uh, of the songs, and there's it's like a a gig of songs, but we also get actors to come along and go do whatever you want that you don't normally do. So I can get Helen Morse to come and do Juliet, and this is a woman who's in her sixties. You know she can you, or, or difficult plays, and it would be a perfect thing if we if I was doing one of these, I'd say to you guys, just come and I'd love you to do just that five minute, and you you know you have a just it's just a way of getting people to go. Don't be afraid of this. This is Shakespeare's just a people's writer. He was writing for people, and that's what that gig is about. And and the last comedy festival gig was a was a wonderful. We had a wonderful time with that. And it's just a way of bringing a lot of musicians and actors together that celebrate Shakespeare's songs. So that's been a great pleasure, yeah. And Different, I'm a bit old school though. I mean, I'm not as hip as you guys. I not hip hop. I'm sort of verging. Yeah. Yeah. Going actual from, instruments. It's going from Crosby, Stills and Nash to traditional folk music. It's like <laughs> we sampled Crosby, you know, Stills and Nash. Now. <laughs> Dave Crosby. <laughs> <laughs> Almost cut my hair. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, I do have a bit of a sense of what draws you as an actor to Shakespeare. Uh, is it daunting for an actor to come to a play that's been, you know, reimagined by actors across centuries in many different countries around the world, languages, etc.? Yeah. How do you, as the Q Brothers have done tonight, how do you bring something new to the performance and how do you prepare yourself to go into something that's been done so often and to do it in a unique way? I always say this to you people who come to see a Shakespeare play or read it, as we told how difficult that was when you first read it. We have no idea what a lot of these plays mean. We li the, the idea is you go through this script and regardless of trying to find anything new to put into it, if you just go through it and you have to go, we have to go through this academic process of going, what's that? Sometimes five times in a line, you're going, what is going on now? But once you find out what's going on, then you learn to put it across to an audience. And the thing is not to hang around. Don't, if, there, if, it's, if there's stuff that I think that an audience isn't going to get, just rock, just rock on with it. Move, move it along. And, and they will go with the story. I think the great thing about watching Shakespeare, it doesn't apply for this because it's fantastically accessible, but Shakespeare that's more difficult is just go with the story. You, it will roll, it's brilliant stuff and you can roll along and get that. Re, the inspiration of, what, of the performance, you, that kind of has to come to you. I think with the comedies, that's uh, been difficult. I was, I've just done Midsummer Night's Dream in this theater and I did it uh, 20 years ago playing bottom both times. And uh, this, you know, I, and, and I, I, I enjoyed the whole of the play bottom the first time, and I messed up that Pyramus and Thisbe scene at the end. I just could not get it funny. And this time I found a way of being, I thought, I'm going to just overact like a mother. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I kind of got the seed. So it's, you, you win some, you lose some. But I've, I've spent a, a, a lot of time with Shakespeare and have really enjoyed it. And the important thing is, not to be precious with it, just get it out there and have a good time with it and give the audience. Not, don't hang around though. Motor boys, motor. <laughs> Mark, you are an international fellow at the Globe Theatre in London. Can yeah. you tell us a little bit about that experience and perhaps what insights you gained into Shakespeare that you didn't previously have? Yeah, sure. Uh, so that happened after I finished studying. Uh, one of my teachers had done this program that they have uh, over at the Globe called the International Actors Fellowship. And uh, so I went over there and spent five weeks with their heads of um, verse, voice, 
movement and text. No, verse and text are the same thing, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, uh, so I worked with the, the staff who work with their actors full time in the theatre and, um, and that was kind of extraordinary. Uh, the, the biggest thing though was the architecture of the space and that when you're performing on that stage, you have no choice but to look at the audience, actually look at them in the eyes and uh, the immediacy of that contact between audience and actor is uh, an extraordinary lesson. It's, and it's, that's one that has stayed with me for sure, yeah. And I think it, it only, like Shakespeare only works if you're aware of the audience. It just is part of the DNA of the text. You, you must talk to them, because they're there. Hello, <laughs> women sitting there, hello. And man sitting alone. <laughs> we'll just stare at you now, make you feel a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, but I do want to ask a question about audiences, and I guess I'll start with you guys because you've just performed to this very audience. Why do you think, and um, we perhaps have touched upon this a little bit, but why do you think audiences love coming back to see Shakespeare again and again, sometimes the same play over and over? Um, it's a really good question. I usually don't, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's, it goes back to the first question that Mark answered is that these, you know, I mean, these are brilliant creations that, that, speak, to, that speak to us. And, and so you can, tell this, you can tell the same story again and again as long as you tell it from a true place. It's like, why do we all watch the same, our favorite movie again and again? Um, though I haven't done that for a long time either. So you might want to answer this question. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I guess, I guess it's just like, um, I don't know, you know, like I was reading that book, that Robert McKee book, that story, have you ever read that, yeah? It's like, he basically breaks it down, there's like 12 real plots out there. So it's like, when you're doing your own spin on it, it doesn't matter if it's another Romeo and Juliet or another story, because the plot is, you know, it's one of 12 plots anyway, so, you know, it's like, I guess it's just... If you're putting your own spin on it, then, then it's fun to watch, especially if you have a favorite. You know what I mean? Like people come back and say, oh, that one's my favorite. I want to see what they're going to do with Bottom. Or I want to see what they're going to do. How, I mean, you know, I don't know how many people really like Othello. Is it, it, or are you just like, that was kind of weird hip-hop show. See, there's a few. <laughs> there's a few. But I mean, like, so when you watch the show tonight, you probably were like, this is a funny take on it. I wonder how they're going to kill her, right? <laughs> So, I mean, it's fun to think of those things, and when somebody has a strong take on it, then wonder how they're going to deal with a certain element or a certain problem. We're writing a version of, a two-man two version of Two Gents right now, and it's, and you know, I know everyone's thinking, how, what are they going to do with the rape? You know, it's like, it's like that's an awkward scene we're going to have to deal with, you know? So, yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. I guess, I don't know if that answers. I mean, I think it comes from a place of wanting to see it done differently, right? Or wanting to see what's different this time. Like, how you attack Richard the second after seeing a thing you thought was shite. Like, how, or maybe they're more interested in the, they're attached to people or creators or they want to see a new actor in it probably a lot of times. Um, yeah, certain plays. Certain plays, of course, that you keep seeing. You keep going, can you do a different one? I mean, I've seen more King Lears than I could throw a <laughs> stick at. And I've been in two shockers. <laughs> but uh, you can't win them all. But, you know, I think, that's, I think that it would be great to get... Uh, I, I, the one thing I do feel is that there are a load of other Shakespeare plays that I'd, I'd love to do that just don't get done. They're just difficult. And that's, that's one of those things that you have to confront but yeah that's a, some places you're just obliged that you're going to see Midsummer Night's Dream again and again you're going to see Romeo and Juliet again and, and I think some of those plays are magnificent plays some of them are good plays but I think <laughs> they're great I'm not a great fan of measure for measure now you can disagree with that I hate that play <laughs> but that's my problem and a lot of people love it I did that one too it was okay, um, but <laughs> but I think that you know we know that we go to see plays and that you just you're finding something different each time you see it. 
And some productions can be funny, a wonderful product. Some productions can be just not funny. But, um, you know, I think it's... I think finding new things, too. I mean, like, my favorite rap albums I could listen to over and over and over, yeah. and I'll be like, holy shit, I've been listening to that for 10 years, and I never caught the pun that he was making or the illusion he was making yeah, in that line. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I'm, that, that happens with Shakespeare all the time. Yeah. So, yeah. and that's maybe the reason. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, to so absorb it, you need a few times of seeing it, you know? Yeah. There's so many words. You're not going to catch everything that first time, you know? That's so. true. So come back tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but we are talking about an <laughs> good plug uh, and uh, you know an unusual adaptation of Shakespeare. Uh, have any of you seen an adaptation of Shakespeare that's really stayed with you for its uniqueness, unusualness, ability to do something very, very different? Yeah, I saw a version of Comedy of Errors at Chicago Shakespeare that is our sort of home base in Chicago, but in the big theater where people pay for tickets a lot, and there's like a subscription and a lot of old people. Um, <laughs> they, uh, they have like, um, they did a version of Comedy of Errors that was a movie, it was, it was in World War I making a movie of Comedy of Errors. Um, and so the in-between parts were uh, when they would yell cut, so there was a movie being shot and they're doing Comedy of Errors and then they would yell cut and somebody had rewritten interstitial moments um, uh, so that these dynamics where this guy's wife is cheating on her and then uh, accounting for that, that they would have to play a really awkward scene later uh, in the play that was kind of mirroring life. That was pretty meta and awesome. It kind of was like a being John Malkovich Shakespeare thing. It was, it was awesome. Um, I forget the guy's name who wrote the thing, but if you look in Chicago Shakespeare, if you want to find that one. Some famous playwright. It was very, like, stopper-desque. It was cool. It was awesome. I think everybody here probably has seen a production where you just went, oh, that's it. It was For me, it was Peter Brook's Midsummer Night's Dream, which was a production that came here, and three of the actors are still in it. But I saw it at the age of 17 in Stratford-on-Avon, and I... I just couldn't think about anything else for two days. I never, and it was e extremely experimental for the time, but that was where I went, I'd like to be part of this. This is really, really good. And that, and I, it's, it's still, I don't know what it'd be like if I saw it now, but when I was 17, it was breathtaking. Changed my, changed my life. Mm. You don't, you only remember the ones you hate, right? Oh, I remember a lot of productions that I hate, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Including a couple of King Lears that uh, this yeah, guy yeah, may or may not have been in, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but a couple of years ago in Berlin, I saw a production of Hamlet at the Schaubühne, and uh, Lars Eidinger was playing Hamlet. And uh, around Act 4, when Laertes has come back, and he said, like, why have you killed my father? Um, in the middle of Hamlet's soliloquy, he's, you know, talking to the audience, and then he stops doing the Shakespeare, which was surtitled above in English, and he says, um, Laertes thinks I have wronged him. Have I wronged Laertes? And there was silence. And so he asked again, have I wronged Laertes? And silence, and he asks it a third time, and then somebody up in the back row calls out, Yah! And instantly, this actor dives into the audience, is climbing over theatre patrons, screaming in German at this guy who said, ja. Yeah. And then somebody else over there says, nein, nein. Blah, 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 blah. And then suddenly, the whole theatre is engaged in this big debate about whether Hamlet has wronged Laertes by killing Polonius. It was extraordinary. And then Hamlet kind of took the argument back and was improvising his response. And then he just weaved back into the rest of the soliloquy. Wow. And uh, I thought about that for a couple of days. Amazing. So it's nearly time to wrap up. And I thought as a closing question, I would ask each of you who your favourite character from Shakespeare is. Oh, it's a toughie. <laughs> Uh, my, my, mine is the one that I haven't played yet, which is Falstaff, which I, I really would. I played Henry the Fourth, but uh, I'd love to have a go at Falstaff one day. 
drink wild times. You know. But <laughs> it's just one of, one of those characters. I, I just love that man. And I, it's not just for the hilarity, but the pathos and the chimes of midnight and the age. It, it, the, the representations of the passing of time are just stunning. Uh, well, one of mine was Richard II. So then I just <laughs> did a show of it. <laughs> um, so I think, I think Hamlet is on, the, is on the list, but also Bottom. I did, uh, I did some bottom at the, at the Globe. I did, I did some bottom. <laughs> the Globe. That Pardon sounds me. fun and weird <laughs> and kinky. <laughs> yeah, so we were rehearsing at the Globe. And it was uh, because they do shows all the way through the day, we could only rehearse at like midnight. And so it was 1 a.m. and I was performing the bit where he wakes up from the dream. And, uh, and so you'd look up and the ceiling of the Globe is painted with the, the zodiac, but then of course you look past that and it's just the night sky. And here's this guy talking about having had this encounter with the goddess of love. <laughs> and that was pretty special. But Hamlet, I reckon Hamlet and Iago. Yeah, those two. The, just the, the small ones. <laughs> just the modest roles, really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you guys? Um, you know, truthfully, the only plays that I know, Shakespeare plays that I know in depth, um, are the ones that we've um, ad adapted or ad wrapped it, as we call it. But the um, so we have the Comedy of Errors, we have Funk It Up About Nothing, we have Othello the Remix. We're working on Mad Summer Night's Dream. We have I Heart Juliet. We're working on Q Gents, <laughs> and those are the ones we know. So out of those, uh, I mean. Iago is, is definitely my, my favorite, uh, favorite to play. And that, and we have a character in, bom in The Bombity of Errors, uh, the jeweler who we meshed in with like another couple other characters and we call him MC Hendelberg. And he's, a, he's this Jewish guy with peos and a, and a giant run DMC jacket and a big gold chain menorah. And he's like, I'm MC Hendelberg, the head of my crew. I dance around town with some something on my shoes, I forget, but, <laughs> but he's really, he's, He's my, he might be my favorite to play, actually, yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, I guess I like Benedict. Um, I played Benedict when we did ours, and I, I think, like, I'm just a sucker for, like, um, the verbal gymnastics aspect of it and, like, the puns and the clever stuff. Because so, I come from the, uh, from the rap side, so I was making beats and rhyming, and G was in school for theater. We kind of combined that way. Um, so I, I love Much Ado because it's just, the whole thing is just witticisms. And, and so Benedict and Beatrice are probably like my favorite. I really like watching them go at it. And when will we see J&G back in Melbourne? Whenever who's in charge here asks us to be <laughs> back, Claire. <Yeah>. Um, <laughs> Uh, we will, we would love, we'll yep. come back through every, every single one. We want to, I mean, we've, we've toured Othello the Remix to uh, eight, nine different countries at this point in two and a half years so uh, we plan on bringing every single one of our pieces through here and this this right. theater has been incredible to us the staff is amazing the crew is amazing um, the audiences have been incredible out of all two so far um, <laughs> Richard's all right Mark's pretty cool but he's like a little depressed and too smart for his own good <laughs> <laughs> you're funny um, <laughs> And uh, that chick's cute right there in the red. Um, no, we love Melvin. We love it. So, yes, we'll always come back. Okay. And we'll be signing CDs uh, on the way out if you want to buy any. Otherwise, peace, and we love you. Well, we look forward to seeing you again. Please thank JG, Richard, and Mark. <laughs>